Two California Highway Patrol officers pulled over a suspected drunk motorist on the San Diego Freeway in Mission Viejo, California, just after 1 in the morning on May 14, 1983. The driver exited his vehicle rather than remaining there and emptied a bottle of beer onto the sidewalk as he did so. As he reached the patrol car, his pants flew out. The individual was identified as Long Beach resident Randy Stephen Kraft, 38. After taking a quick look at his driver's license, while acknowledging his drinking, Kraft insisted he was sober. He was arrested for drunk driving after a field sobriety test showed otherwise. The arrest appeared to be another typical set of night Dewey in Orange County so far. After that, as Sergeant Michael Howard drew near Kraft's vehicle, he noticed a man slumped in the passenger seat, only partially shielded by a jacket, with empty beer bottles lying all about him. On the driver's seat, in plain view, was a folding knife. There was no reaction as Howard rapped on the window. He attempted in vain to awaken Kraft's passenger by opening the door. The man's genitalia were visible, and his pants were unzipped. He had no pulse and red markings around his neck, suggesting that he had been strangled. At 1.21 a.m., the man was pronounced dead by paramedics. Sheriff's deputies from Orange County acquired a search warrant for Kraft's automobile and searched it for proof. They also discovered nine different prescription medicines, including Valium and several painkillers, in addition to the alcohol. Despite the fact that the deceased had no visible wounds, the seat cushion beneath the lifeless passenger was covered with blood. The most unsettling discovery was a collection of 47 Polaroids of young males in their underwear who appeared to be comatose or dead. A legal pad sheet of yellow paper with 61 cryptic notes neatly printed in two columns was found in a briefcase in the trunk. Stable was the first word, and what you got was the last. The notes would soon be described by detectives as a coded list of murder victims. Terry Gambrel, a 25-year-old Marine assigned to the adjacent El Toro Marine Air Base, was quickly recognized as Kraft's passenger. High quantities of alcohol in the prescription sedative Ativan, one of the drugs discovered in Kraft's automobile, were identified in his blood. He may have died from the medicines and beer taken together, but a ligature strangulation was determined by an autopsy. The searchers then went to the house Kraft shared with his gay partner Jeffrey Seeley, where they discovered a wealth of proof. The identical couch that was used to pose numerous of the bare-chested models for Kraft's Polaroid collection existed in the living room. A dated yellow rug in the home seems to match the materials taken from a body discovered in Anaheim in April 1978. Police discovered an intriguing collection of mismatched belts, chains, shoelaces, and garments in Kraft's garage. One of the jackets belonged to a murder victim from Michigan who was killed in December 1982. In the following days, detectives would locate three more California murder victims who Kraft had captured in his Polaroids. His prints would match those on pieces of shattered glass at a crime scene from December 1975. At first, Terry Gambrell's murder was the sole count against Kraft, who was detained without being released on $250,000 bond on May 16, 1983. He entered a not guilty plea to the case, but Judge Gary Ryan deemed him dangerous enough to quadruple bail, essentially imprisoning Kraft pending trial. One week later, Kraft's counsel described him as quiet, nonviolent, and hardworking at a bail reduction hearing. In response, Prosecutor Brian Brown accused Kraft of four further homicides from the beginning of 1983, whose victims included 18 year old Jeffrey Nelson, 19 year old Robert Loggins, 20 year old Roger Duvall, and 21 year old Eric Church. Judge Robert Thomas completely revoked Kraft's bail after accepting his not guilty plea on those counts. A week later, Kraft was accused of killing 22-year-old Mark Hall under torture in 1975. Patrick Kearney, the trash bag killer, and William Bonin, the freeway killer, who were both implicated in 49 homicides in 1978 and 1981, respectively, had left California in a state of shock. Now, homicide detectives thought Randy Kraft might have killed more people than Kearney and Bonin put together. On March 19, 1945, Randy Kraft was born in Long Beach, California, the only son and fourth child of parents who had relocated to the area from Wyoming four years previously. Kraft had a history of mishaps as a child, breaking his collarbone at the age of one and knocking himself out a year later after falling down a flight of stairs. The family relocated to Westminster in the avowedly conservative county of Orange in 1948. When it came to politics, Randy was said to fall somewhere to the right of Attila the Hun by high school friends. He played the saxophone in the band, graduated in June 1963, and then transferred with a group of trusty friends to the traditional Claremont College in Pomona, California, that September. At Claremont, 
Kraft enlisted in the ROTC, participated in pro-Vietnam War protests, and actively supported Barry Goldwater as the right-wing candidate for president in 1964. The following year, though, he underwent a major transformation, shifting leftward politically and sporting a mustache and longer hair. He discovered part-time work as a bartender at a gay pub in Garden Grove. Rumors regarding Kraft's passion for bondage had started to spread during his junior year at university at Claremont. According to Kraft's roommate, he would disappear with regularity, maybe two, three times a week, and then reappear at odd hours. He didn't want you to know about what he did, he said. Kraft ingested Valium in between lessons and disappearing acts in an attempt to relieve his stomach aches and migraines. In 1966, Kraft left campus and lived at Huntington Beach with a male buddy, spending most of his free time in gay bars. He was detained that year for engaging in indecent behavior after seducing an undercover police officer in Huntington Beach, but was released with a warning for the first time. Alcohol addiction and late-night poker games stopped Kraft from graduating from school in June 1967 with the rest of his class. Eight months later, Kraft received his bachelor's degree in economics after having to repeat a course. By then, Kraft had devoted himself to another political campaign, exerting the same amount of effort for Robert Kennedy in 1968 as he did for Barry Goldwater in the preceding four years. Kraft received a personal letter from RFK for his zeal and he was devastated when his candidate was killed by an assassin in June. A few days later, Kraft enlisted in the U.S. Air Force after successfully passing background checks and passing aptitude tests to receive a secret security clearance. He oversaw the test aircraft's painting while stationed at Edwards Air Force Base. When Kraft came out as gay in 1969, his family was taken aback. So were his Air Force superiors, who released him in July on the pretext of health. Kraft resumed his bartending duties once he was back in the real world, went on a diet of speed and beer, and fully embraced the LGBT community. When Kraft said, there's a part of me that you will never know, in a cryptic manner to his old pals, they were perplexed and seeking to understand. They didn't understand what he meant for another 14 years. And when they did, the revelation would leave them in absolute shock. Even into the 1970s, Kraft's unpredictable conduct persisted. Randy used to go away for a few days, then return and lock himself in his room for a few more days. According to one former roommate, he would walk toward the Marine base. He would only murmur something about going down and seeking for Marines when discussing it. A really anal retentive kind of guy, said one person of Kraft, extremely uptight and very strict with himself. Friends claimed that he occasionally wigged out and had an extremely explosive temper. In March 1970, a 13-year-old runaway encountered Kraft on the Huntington Beach beachfront and became Kraft's first known victim. Joseph Alwyn Fancher was taken home by Kraft, who fed him marijuana, pills, and champagne while showing him pictures of guys having intercourse. When Kraft sodomized Fancher while he was still partially aware, Fancher barely resisted, but just enough for Kraft to issue a death threat. After Kraft left for work, Fancher fled the flat and stumbled barefoot to a neighboring tavern where customers dialed 911. At the hospital, his stomach was pumped, and Fancher guided officers back to Kraft's house to look for his shoes, along with the sneakers. They also discovered 76 images of Kraft having intercourse with different guys and a variety of illegal narcotics. Police realized their case was hopeless because the search was conducted without a warrant. Therefore, they decided not to make an arrest. In 1971, Kraft obtained employment at a Huntington Beach bottling facility. He had an IQ of 129 on a job-related test, which is regarded as very clever, and he toured gay bars at night while operating a forklift during the day. The desire to party overpowered Kraft's desire to succeed academically. He briefly enrolled at Long Beach State University and began taking education courses with the goal of earning a teaching credential. Randy continued to live up to his reputation, visiting gay clubs for random people and expressing a clear predilection for Marines even after classmate Jeff Graves became Kraft's live-in partner. In southern Orange County on October 5, 1971, police discovered a man's naked, decomposing body next to Ortega Highway. Wayne Joseph Duquette, a 30-year-old gay bartender from Long Beach who had been missing for two weeks, was identified by the body as his. The coroner estimated that he passed away around September 20, but there was no visible evidence of mistreatment. Clothing and other belongings belonging to Duquette were never located. He arrived first. The following verified victim of Southern California's most recent murder spree was discovered adjacent to the 405 freeway in Seal Beach the day after Christmas 1972. After nearly 15 months had passed, a 20-year-old Marine named Edward Daniel Moore was last seen on Christmas Eve at his barracks at Camp Pendleton. At 1.45 in the morning, a driver discovered him, allegedly tossed from a moving automobile. Moore was bitten on the genitalia. 
had been bludgeoned and strangled and had one of his own socks shoved into his rectum. A naked John Doe was discovered next to the Terminal Island Freeway in the Wilmington neighborhood of Los Angeles six weeks later, on February 6, 1973. He was roughly 18 years old when he was strangled just a few days before he was discovered. A brown sock was put inside the victim's anus, who has never been identified. Another gruesome find, another John Doe corpse dumped at Huntington Beach, was made on Easter Sunday. The only items missing from this person's outfit were shoes and socks, but his genitalia were missing from beneath the bloody slacks. His wrists had scars from ligatures. It was unclear whether asphyxiation or blood loss caused the death. The body parts of the following victim, a second John Doe, were severed and dispersed throughout two counties. The head was found in Long Beach, the torso, right leg, and both arms were found in San Pedro, and the left leg was found in Sunset Beach. There were obvious signs of bondage, and the bones had been chilled before being dumped. Never were the victim's hands discovered. On July 28, 1973, Ron Weeb, a 20-year-old Fullerton resident, disappeared while out drinking. Two days later, Seal Beach police discovered his dead body next to the 405 freeway, fully dressed but without shoes. Before being slain, Weeb was shackled and seemingly hanged upside down after being beaten and strangled and through torture that included bites to his stomach and penis. He was found to have one of his own missing socks in his rectum. On December 29, 1973, the body of Vincent Cruz Mestas, a 23-year-old art student, was recovered from a ravine in the San Bernardino Mountains. He had one of his own socks wedged inside his anus and, like Ron Weeb, was dressed but barefoot. Cruz had just shaved his head and face, and his hands were gone. Plastic sandwich bags were placed over the bloodied stumps. Prior to his passing, a pencil-sized object that was never identified had been pressed into his penis. Prior to murdering 20-year-old Malcolm Eugene Little on June 1, 1974, the assailant reportedly had a six-month vacation. His naked body was found propped up against a mesquite tree next to Highway 86, west of the Salton Sea in Imperial County. A week before he passed away, Little, an unemployed truck driver from Alabama, had come to hunt for a job. In order to highlight the amputated genitals, his killer stretched the body's legs before ramming a mesquite branch six inches into the victim's rectus. Three weeks later, the hunter killed another U.S. Marine at a bar in San Clement, where he told pals he had secured a lift to Los Angeles for the weekend. 18-year-old Roger Dickerson was last seen alive. He omitted to tell them the identity of the driver, who supposedly sodomized and choked Dickerson and left bite marks on his left nipple and penis before dumping the naked body close to a Laguna Beach golf course. On August 3, 1974, oil field workers in Long Beach discovered the second victim. He was identified as 25-year-old Thomas Paxton Lee, a local waiter and occasionally gay hustler who was last seen alive at a pub in Wilmington the previous evening. He was manually strangled and left completely clothed. In southern Orange County, 23-year-old Gary Wayne Cordova was discovered by a highway while fully dressed but without shoes. An alcohol and Valium overdose led to death. Neither of the victims was initially associated with the murder spree because they lacked any of the killer's signature mutilation. But when Irvine police discovered James Dale Reeves' body on November 29, 1974, there were no questions about him. A gay 19-year-old had gone out cruising on Thanksgiving Day while bare-chested, save for a bloodied t-shirt, and had never come back. His killer left a tree limb that was four feet long and three inches in diameter sticking out of his anus and spread-legged. John Liras, a 17-year-old high school student, was killed in December 1974, and it appears that two murderers were responsible. Liras, the youngest victim to date, had disappeared while traveling to a skating rink in Long Beach to test out the roller skates he had just gotten for Christmas. He was discovered by some parents with strollers swimming in the ocean near Sunset Beach with a wooden surveyor stick driven through his rectus. Liras had alcohol in his system and had been strangled while bound. He was transported from a parking lot to the water, leaving two pairs of footprints in the sand. On January 17, 1975, just after noon, construction workers discovered the body of Craig Victor Johnitz, 21, who had been strangled to death close to a Long Beach motel on the Pacific Coast Highway. Johnitz wearing two pairs of pants, one on top of the other, and was otherwise completely clothed. He was just without shoes. Nothing else was left behind by his killer. On January 24, 1975, Investigators from various jurisdictions gathered in Santa Ana to form a task team as a result of the killer's tightening timetable. 
The meeting was attended by deputies from Orange, Imperial, and San Bernardino counties as well as police officers from Los Angeles, Long Beach, Seal Beach, Irvine, and Huntington Beach. The group also included three forensic psychologists, an FBI profiler from Quantico, Virginia, and a special investigator from the California State Attorney General's office. Although several murders were compared, none provided any useful leads. The killer is a man who desires to be macho but does not feel masculine biting the nipples and genitals of his target to symbolically render the victim a female, according to Dr. Emancel Patterson of UC Irvine. The killings persisted unabatedly. On March 29, 1975, Keith Davin Crotwell, a 19-year-old dropout from high school, thumbed southward rides before disappearing. His decapitated head was discovered on May 8 by three youngsters who were starfishing close to the Long Beach Marina. A few days later, friends found the black and white Mustang that took Crotwell on his last ride after searching Long Beach for it. On May 19, police located the registration and questioned Randy Kraft, the proprietor. Although Kraft acknowledged giving Crotwell a ride and just roaming around, he insisted he left the young man at an all-night cafe alive and well. Since there was no body or known cause of death, la, county prosecutors declined the detective's request to prosecute Kraft with murder. Kraft, who was at the time working part-time as a computer operator for a charter flight company at Long Beach Airport, was troubled by the close call. His chronic stomach aches and migraines got worse, and his insomnia made things even worse. He was identified by a physician as having hypoglycemia, a condition that Jerome Brudos, an Oregon serial murderer, also experienced. In Cherry Park in June 1975, Kraft was detained for petty lewd behavior. After that, his employer downsized and fired Randy. But his computer skills soon landed Kraft a job with a different consulting company. After a 24-week pause, the murders started up again. On Halloween of 1975, 21-year-old Larry Jean Walters was slain in Los Angeles County. On New Year's Eve two months later, 22-year-old Mark Hall vanished from a gathering in San Juan Capistrano. On January 3, 1976, along the border with Riverside County, off-duty police officers discovered his naked corpse in the Cleveland National Forest. His legs had been slashed with a knife, his eyes, face, chest, and genitals burned with a cigarette lighter, a cocktail stirrer had been forced through his penis with enough force to enter the bladder, and his genitalia had been severed and stuffed into his rectum along with dirt and leaves before he was killed. He was naked and bound to a sapling. Hall's blood alcohol level was seven times the legal limit, which was undoubtedly a deadly amount. However, the murderer had made sure of this by stuffing more leaves and dirt up Hall's throat. After Kraft's police troubles in 1975, his friendship with Jeff Graves started to deteriorate. By the end of the year, they had broken up, and Kraft moved in with Jeff Selig, then 19 years old, to share an apartment in Laguna Hills. Early in 1976, at about the same time, an unidentified predator in California started taking younger victims. Although many victims were still dumped alongside highways, they were now frequently placed in trash bags, sometimes dumped in dumpsters, and only discovered when the bags tore while being picked up. In 1976, nine murders are proven, and it's possible that there were yet more buried in landfills, trash cans, and incinerators. Oliver Peter Molitor, 13, was the first fatality of the year. On March 21, 1976, his body was discovered on Manhattan Beach. On April 7, two and a half weeks later, Kenneth Eugene Buchanan, then 17 years old, was abandoned in Inglewood. On April 19, Larry Armendariz, 14, was found in Los Angeles, and on June 11, Michael Craig McGee, 13, was found at Redondo Beach. Randall Lawrence Moore, 16, was the victim in October. He was found in a trash bag near Highway 80, east of El Cajon. On December 10, 19-year-old Paul Futch disappeared from Redondo Beach and was never found. On the Mexican border, other dead were dumped at Barrigo Hot Springs and close to Calexico. Authorities were still perplexed because they couldn't connect the very scant clues they had to any known suspect. The 1977 surrender of Patrick Kearney and his subsequent confessions to the trash bag killings of 28 young men diverted California police's attention. Kearney, however, resisted claiming tortured victims because his victims were often shot in the head. After a sort of hiatus, the Savage Highway killings resumed in early 1978, after Kearney was taken to San Quentin Jail. The first victim of the year was identified as Scott Michael Hughes, a 19-year-old Marine from Camp Pendleton who was discovered on April 16 by the 91 freeway near Orange. Hughes was dressed to the nines, but his shoes were without laces. The left testicle was removed from his genitalia, which were covered in blood beneath his ruined pants. Hughes, who was referred to by his fellow Marines as a boisterous drug user, died from ligature strangulation despite having Valium in his blood. After one of his frequent arrests for public intoxication, 
Roland Young, 23, was released from Orange County Jail two months later on June 10. He escaped the prison at 8.19 p.m. and wasn't seen again until 3.30 a.m. June 11, lying lifeless in a gutter in Irvine. Young drank booze and took Valium after being let out of jail. When a sadist cut off his scrotum and a portion of his penis, stabbed him four times in the chest, and clothed his corpse, his hands were chained. Another Marine, Richard Keith, age 23, was claimed by the stalker the day of Young's funeral. To meet his fiancée in Los Angeles, Keith hitchhiked from Camp Pendleton, but after arguing with her over it, he decided to return to the base at 11 p.m. on June 19. The following morning in southern Orange County, a firefighter who was not on duty discovered his body. Police once more suspected two assassins, one who drove and one who pushed Keith's body out of the moving vehicle. Keith Klingbale, a resident of Washington, was still alive when he was discovered on July 6, 1978, stretched across an I-5 northbound lane in Mission Viejo. At 3.30 in the morning, paramedics responded to the site but were unable to save the man from a severe alcohol and Tylenol overdose. Klingbale's ankles were found to have ligature marks, and one of his nipples had burns from a cigarette lighter. The following victim was Michael Joseph in Derbyton a 21-year-old truck driver from Long Beach who was discovered on November 18, 1978. In Derbyton was thrown 20 feet away from the location where Edward Moore was discovered in December 1972 after being emasculated and sodomized with a huge foreign object and having his eyelids scorched with a car cigarette lighter. On June 16, 1979, Donald Harold Crissel was pushed from a slow-moving car near the 405 freeway in Irvine, according to several witnesses. However, they could not agree on whether Crystal's last ride was a car or a van. When police arrived, the body of the young Marine, which had tire prints on it and ligature marks on the neck and wrists, was still warm. Death resulted from an alcohol and painkiller overdose rather than from strangulation or injuries sustained when falling from the car. In 1979, more than a dozen male corpses, with victims ranging in age from 13 to 24, were discovered alongside freeways in Southern California. Thomas Lundgren 13, who was picked up in Reseda on May 28 at 11 a.m. and dumped in Agora at 1.30 p.m., was one of those who the police were able to identify. Lundgren had been repeatedly stabbed, beaten, strangled, and had his throat and genitalia severed. Marcus Grabs, then 17 years old, thumbed his last ride out of Newport Beach along the Pacific Coast Highway on August 5, 1979. He was found sodomized, stabbed, and murdered at 6.30 the following morning adjacent to the Ventura Freeway, close to the li county line. Construction workers discovered 15-year-old Donald Hayden, who had been sodomized and strangled and put in a dumpster at a new housing project in Liberty Canyon after he had been last seen alive in Hollywood at 1 a.m. on August 27, 1979. On September 9, while traveling along Highway 101, David Murillo, 17, vanished. Two days later, his naked corpse was discovered on the shoulder of the road, anally R-worded, strangled, and with rope burns on his ankles. Gay clubs in Southern California started to post alerts for patrons as well as images requesting information to identify various John Doe victims. One regular at the bar scene, Randy Kraft, appeared to disregard the danger and was unperturbed by the bloodbath. He appeared to be enjoying the time of his life. In fact, in July 1979, Randy Kraft was making enough money working as a freelance data processing specialist to live with Jeff Selig in a Long Beach home. They also had a lengthy East Coast tour from New York City to Key West as well as trips to Mexico in August 1978 and Lake Tahoe in May 1979. Friends note that both men kept bizarre hours, with Kraft continuing his habit of aimless late-night travels while Selig ran a bakery. Lear Sigler Industries, which had regional operations in Michigan, Oregon, and San Diego, hired Kraft as a consultant by August 1980. He made at least $50,000 a year in 1980 and 1981 between his regular salary and freelance work on the weekends. The hard work paid off for Kraft's employers, who praised him as a self-starter, great problem-solver, and an amazing employee, deserves exceptional care. Kraft frequently lived off of junk food, which aggravated his hypoglycemia and resulted in accompanying chest problems. Randy despised Selig's attempts to rule the relationship, and in June 1982 he sought treatment with Selig. Their therapist described Jeff as defensive and agitated with an insatiable sex urge. To solve their issues, they planned a trip to Europe, but neither ever seemed to have the time. Kraft frequently left therapy sessions early to go on business in Oregon, the San Francisco Bay Area, and Michigan. And the killings persisted everywhere Kraft went. After high school, Michael Sean O'Fallon, a 17-year-old native of Colorado, intended to explore the world. In June 1980, he hitchhiked to British Columbia and returned to Oregon before his luck ran out. 
On July 17, 1980, his naked body was discovered along I-5, 10 miles from Salem. O'Fallon had a cord wrapped around his scrotum and was hogtied with shoelaces. Despite having Valium and alcohol concentrations that were nearly deadly, strangling was the cause of death. Children playing near El Toro Marine Air Base on September 3, 1980, discovered Robert Wyatt Loggins Jr.'s body wrapped in a plastic trash bag. Loggins, a Marine who was 19 years old and last saw alive on August 22, had been dead for two to three days before he was discovered. He had just been exiled from the barracks for drinking, and on his first night of freedom he had vanished, his blood proven to contain lethal amounts of alcohol and antihistamines. Police first regarded Randy Kraft's death as accidental despite the plastic wrap until 1983, when evidence collected from Kraft's house and automobile caused them to rethink their position. The first victim of 1981 was 17-year-old Michael Dwayne Cluck. In April, he hitchhiked from Seattle to California, making it as far as Oregon before accepting a lift from a murderer. Cluck was brutally sodomized before being brutally kicked and beaten to death before being dumped along I-5 close to Goshen. His thighs and crotch were also scratched with fingernails. Randy Kraft went to a local hospital the same day his body was discovered for treatment of a damaged foot that he said occurred inadvertently while he was wandering barefoot in his hotel room. On July 29, residents of Los Angeles Echo Park called the police to report offensive aromas coming from the neighboring Hollywood Freeway. Officers went there to investigate and pulled two bodies out of a gully. One victim, Raymond Davis, 13, had vanished a few weeks previously while trying to find a missing puppy. The other was 16-year-old Robert Avila, who had been reported missing from Hollywood and was the subject of fruitless psychic searches by his parents. Christopher Williams, then 17 years old, was discovered dead next to a road in the San Bernardino Mountains three weeks later, on August 20, 1981. Williams, a notorious Hollywood hustler, had taken two separate sedatives before someone put paper up his nose, causing him to choke. In 1982, Kraft's hectic schedule kept both him and the cops on the go. On November 26, a third victim from Oregon, 26-year-old Brian Witcher, who had died from asphyxiation and had been drugged with alcohol and Valium, was discovered along I-5 near Portland. On December 7, Kraft attended an LSI computer conference in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Dennis Alt and Chris Sconeborn, cousins, disappeared that evening from the hotel bar owned by Kraft. Their bodies were discovered together in Plainfield Township two days later. Both were injected with Valium and booze before being strangled. Alt was completely dressed, save for shoes, with his shirt pulled up and his slacks unzipped to reveal his genitalia. Sconeborn was nude, with a ballpoint pen from Kraft's hotel being inserted into his bladder through the penis. Kraft had returned to Oregon and another teen had passed away by the time Alt and Sconeborn were discovered. A driver discovered 19-year-old Lance Trenton tags by a neighboring road on December 9, as Kraft was leaving his Wilsonville motel. Tags was not distant from the location where Brian Witcher was abandoned in November. Tags, a former Hawaii resident, moved home with his grandparents in September 1982. He had since passed away after choking on a sock his killer had pushed down his throat while under the influence of drink and Valium. Anthony Jose Silvera, 29, was found dead outside Hubbard, Oregon, nine days later by a man collecting cans. When Silvera was last seen on deck, three hitchhiking from his job, he had been drinking and taking Valium. Silvera was then strangled and sodomized with a huge foreign object, leaving him with a red plastic toothbrush sticking out of his anus. In Southern California, where other victims had been drugged and strangled during the previous 10 years, authorities noticed a pattern in the killings and obtained information from there. To find frequent visitors from California, a computer search of airline records, hotel ledgers, and rental vehicle agencies was started, before Randy Kraft's name would appear 18 times on the final list. He was pulled over in Orange County for drunken driving while carrying a body in the passenger seat. In 1983, the death toll in California kept rising. On January 28, the 21-year-old victim Eric Church was discovered sodomized, beaten, and strangled next to the 605 freeway. Semen taken from his body was later confirmed to match Kraft's blood type. In 1984, Michael Lane, 24, went missing while hitchhiking through Orange County. Kraft was already incarcerated when Lane's skeleton was discovered nearby. On February 11th, Jeffrey Nelson, age 18, and Roger Duvall Jr., age 20, went missing together while out drinking. Two days later, they were discovered together near Claremont College, drugged, sodomized, and strangled. Authorities finally got their break accidentally when Kraft was arrested in Orange County for the murder of Terry Gambrell, three months and one day later. Although the predator was in a cage, it would take years of work for the prosecution to be convinced he would stop killing. Two neatly printed columns.
30 cryptic entries on the left side of a yellow legal page and 31 on the right made up Randy Kraft's purported death list. Stable was the first word and what you got was the last. The document continued to cause problems for the authorities despite their conviction that the list was a coded scorecard of Kraft's victims. Only one of the four entries, 2 in 1 Hedge, 2 in 1 Beach, GR2, and 2 in 1 MKV to PL, appeared to allude to double murders, bringing the death toll to 65. 2 in 1 Hitch is thought to have referred to the killings of Jeffrey Nelson and Roger Duvall. Police maintained that there are no entries for Erich Church or Terry Gambrel, but eventually connected 45 remarks from the list with known victims. Final death toll, 67, with 22 still missing and unidentified. Was it real, though? The scorecard entries in some cases appeared to be almost translucent. The letters EDM stood for Edward Daniel Moore, and Jailout stood for Roland Young, who died shortly after being let out of the Orange County drunk tank. Lance Tags, who had recently returned to Oregon from the Aloha State, seemed to fit the description Portland, Hawaii. Michael O'Fallon, a native of Colorado who was also killed in Oregon, was known as Portland, Denver, while Michael Cluck's mutilated body was known as Portland Blood. The freeway on-ramp where Ron Weeb was dumped in 1973 was designated 7th Street, and the ramp where Kraft dumped Scott Hughes was designated Euclid. Richard Keith's girlfriend lived in the La, neighborhood known as Marine Carson. Keith Crotwell and Kraft's tragic meeting was described in Parking Lot. New Year's Eve brought up Mark Hall's disappearance. Robert Loggins was once known as MCHB Tattoo. Westminster date commemorated the disappearance of 15-year-old Jeffrey Brian Sayre, who went missing on November 24, 1979, after seeing his girlfriend in Westminster. A dead body named Airplane Hill was found close to Huntington Beach. Don Crissel, who was dumped without his trousers in Irvine, was renamed Marine Drunk Overnight Shorts. Other notations, such as Stable, Angel, Harikari, England, Oil, Twiggy, Portland, Portland Head, Portland Reserve, Portland Eck, and others, remain mysterious. Kraft was of no assistance to police, obstinately insisting that the notes referred to various liaisons with K-lovers still in existence or to other banal incidents from his daily life. After all, he was anal-retentive and prone to compulsive actions. Both the list and Kraft were innocent, according to Kraft. Police had a different opinion. They discovered a corpse in Randy's car, a jacket belonging to another victim hidden in his garage, photographs of several other victims stashed there, rug fibers pulled from another body, Kraft's fingerprints found at a crime scene, and a list connecting the killings, identifying Kraft as a prolific trophy hunter. It was now up to the prosecutors to make it credible in court. During a press conference on September 8, 1983, Orange County Sheriff Brad Gates revealed that his men had been able to establish Randy Kraft's propensity, without a doubt for sexually deviant behavior that goes back to the 1970 period. The final list of victims included Don Crissel, Keith Crotwell, Scott Hughes, Michael Inderbaton, Richard Keith, Edward Moore, Ron Weeb, Roland Young, and John Doe from 1973. Prosecutor Brian Brown claimed he was prepared for trial on 16 murder counts. After five postponements, the preliminary hearing for Kraft started on September 27, 1983, and lasted for seven weeks. Judge John Ryan forbade cameras from entering his court but denied a request from the defense to keep onlookers out. Homicide detectives detailed the evidence connecting Kraft to multiple murders, while Highway Patrol officers described Kraft's capture with a corpse in his car. Walter Fisher and Robert Richards, forensic pathologists, described the injuries sustained by particular victims. Brian Brown called Kraft a true scorecard killer during closing arguments, while Doug Otto maintained that Brown had not established any facts. Judge Ryan determined that there was enough proof to hold Kraft for trial. But it wouldn't begin with Doug Otto there. He left the case in August 1984 after becoming frustrated with Kraft's insistence on acting as co-counsel. Otto was quickly removed, but the protracted legal wrangling cost the state of California $2 million by April 1986. Six more murder accusations in Oregon and two more in Michigan were brought against Kraft, but none of them ever made it to trial. On September 26, 1988, more than five years after his arrest, Kraft's trial began before Judge Donald McCartan. Despite McCartan's decision to forbid any mention of victims other than the 16 included in the Orange County indictment, defense petitions to suppress all evidence from the 1983 searches were granted. Attorney C. Thomas McDonald's opening speech described Kraft as a homeowner, taxpayer, and hard worker, just like many other citizens of our country, while dismissing the state's case as suspicion, innuendo, and prosecutorial rhetoric. Conclusion, Mr. Kraft did not kill anyone. 
In order to refute that claim, the prosecution questioned more than 157 witnesses and provided 1,052 exhibits. On November 30, 1988, the prosecution rested its case. William Bonin and Patrick Kearney, two incarcerated serial killers, were the most prominent of Kraft's defense team's alternate suspects. After the conclusion of closing arguments on May 1, 1989, the jury considered for 11 days before rendering its decision. They found Kraft guilty of all 16 murder charges, as well as one count each of sodomy and mutilation. However, they cleared him of sodomizing Roger Duvall. On June 5, the trial for Kraft's separate penalty phase got underway. A collection of family photo albums was displayed by the defense team in an effort to humanize their client throughout his six years in prison. Nearly a dozen jailers testified that Kraft had been a model prisoner. Former co-workers described Kraft as sociable, gregarious, and normal, with one saying that society would lose a very clever intellect if he were put to death. After the guilty decision, Kraft's attorneys were unable to maintain Randy's innocence, so they brought a psychiatrist to testify that Randy's violence was something that he had no control over. Prior to calling their evidence silly and so far afield it's foolish, Judge McCartan allowed a number of ministers who opposed the death penalty to testify. The state contacted Joe Fancher, a runaway 13-year-old who was imprisoned in Orange County following his Colorado parole for auto theft, to detail Kraft's assault in March 1970. There's nothing wrong with him other than the fact that he enjoys killing for sexual fulfillment, Prosecutor Brown told the jury after seeing the scorecard list. On August 11, 1989, the jury concurred and recommended the death punishment. When he gave Kraft a death sentence on November 29, Judge McCartan made it official. McCartan remarked that he had received a number of messages from parents of children who had vanished, asking for details on whether Kraft had killed their sons. In the future, McCartan advised, with response to your legal reasons for appeals, perhaps you might give some thought in your final days to aiding these folks. Kraft was contemplating, to be sure, but he seemed to just be interested in helping himself. In Orange County history, Kraft's trial was the longest and most expensive. But the appeals process would go on for much longer, 13 years and counting, so far. However, Kraft had other legal gimmicks up his sleeve. His second appeal, which claimed that California's gas chamber violated First Amendment religious principles by requiring a condemned person to actively participate in his own killing, was immediately dismissed. Kraft filed a lawsuit against author Dennis McDougall and publisher Warner Books in 1992 over the publication of Angel of Darkness, a study of his case that Kraft claimed damaged his good character by inaccurately depicting him as a sick, twisted guy and ruined his prospects for future work. Although Kraft's case was dismissed as baseless in June 1994, it cost McDougall and Warner about $50,000 in legal fees. Kraft demanded $62 million in damages. With approval from a state appellate judge, McDougall retaliated against Kraft in September 1994 by attempting to recoup fees from him and possibly seizing the computer Kraft had used to file his complaint. McDougall told reporters, I'm not going after this because I think Randy will have a hoard of gold doubloons under his mattress. What worries me about all of this is that a felon, and one who has been found guilty of the most horrific crimes imaginable, can sue whomever they choose without repercussions, frequently. The state allows them to do it without charging them a thing to file, and they load the courts with fake baloney litigation. The possibility of unidentified collaborators and the missing names from Kraft's scorecard were of more concern to the authorities. In March 1995, 18-year-old drifter Kevin Clark Bailey, Kraft's Huntington Beach John Doe victim, was finally identified. However, 22 other names from the death list remain unknown, and forensic evidence in two cases, the Lyra's footprints and unidentified semen found on Eric Church's corpse, suggests at least one other killer is still at large. Years after Kraft's conviction and their years in civil court, author McDougall believes he has partially solved the mystery. In his article that appeared in Beach Magazine in January 2000, McDougall detailed his conversations with a man named Bob Jackson, who is said to have confessed to killing two hitchhikers in Wyoming and Colorado alongside Kraft before joining Kraft in several California killings after 1977. Jackson assumed the corresponding notation on Kraft's cryptic list related to one of their joint homicides because Kraft gave him the nickname Twiggy. Even more horrifying, he revealed to McDougall that the dead count was closer to 100 and that the list only contained Kraft's most memorable murders. In addition to providing tape recordings of the interviews, McDougall informed the Orange County Sheriff's Department of Jackson's allegations. Despite questioning Jackson and eventually convincing him to check himself into a mental hospital, no murder charges were brought. The killing of two nameless drifters nearly 30 years ago has not been verified by authorities in Colorado or Wyoming.
While on death row, Randy Kraft passed the time by playing bridge. His habitual partners were condemned serial killers Lawrence Bittaker, Sunset Strip Slayer Douglas Clark, and Freeway Killer William Bond. Together, the four were found guilty of 41 murders. However, if police rumors are to be believed, the real death toll is likely closer to 100, with Kraft being accountable for two-thirds of that number. With his execution on February 23, 1996, Bonin left the game shorthanded, but the others continued. On August 11, 2000, the California Supreme Court upheld Randy Kraft's execution.